So if we look at pre-Raphaelite paintings, uh, the women's question, this is really something that uh, crops up again and again and very often uh, they present images of women, uh, very often sympathetic images of women, even the kinds of women that would be, uh, that would be um, looked down upon by the Victorian mainstream society. The artists generally tended to be, uh, to be friendly with different kinds of women and uh, to be an artist model was quite a notorious profession and not very highly regarded. Uh, this is something true about the pre-Raphaelites. They tried not to use the services of professional models, but rather uh, to portray their friends, family members, lovers, wives. So um, they believed that it would be more interesting to portray someone with whom they had um, some sort of emotional attachment, some sort of relationship. So sometimes you have the same women cropping up over and over again. Uh, women like uh, Effie Ruskin and then Effie Miller or um, Lizzie Siddle. And uh, she was the model for perhaps the most famous uh, pre-Raphaelite painting ever, um, Miller's Ophelia. And later she became the partner and wife of Rossetti. So he would paint her as well. Uh, if we look at the female portraits of the pre-Raphaelites, the first circle, so the brotherhood and other uh, less, uh, uh, lesser members like Walter Devereux, uh, we see very sympathetic image of femininity. If we look, for example, at Walter Devereux's pet. Uh, we have a um, wealthily dressed woman in a conservatory in the garden um, playing with her pet bird. But um, the title is ambiguous. Who is the pet here really? Is this the bird? Is this the dog uh, which is also in the picture? Or is it the woman herself? And uh, is the woman dreaming of her lost freedom? just like the caged bird. So we have all kinds of images like that, very sympathetic uh, towards the plight of women in the Victorian society. Sometimes they are um, nostalgic and uh, uh, romantic, sometimes they are tragic, sometimes they show uh, femme fatale, sometimes they, so, they show tragic heroines dying, sometimes they show young girls dreaming, like the, uh, the heroine of Miles, the bridesmaid, a teenage girl um, going through a ritual of putting a piece of wedding uh, cake through a ring. This was a kind of love magic that was quite popular in Victorian period so among teenage girls. Uh, so if you were a member of the wedding if, and you did that, you would have a dream about your own future husband. So here we have this uh, young girl with budding womanhood. So the moment when she ceases to be a child and really becomes a young woman. We have lots of illustrations of all kinds of stories, uh, like a um, story from Boccaccio, Lorenzo and Isabella, popularized by Keats's poem, Isabella and the Pot of Basil, uh, about doomed lovers. So we have uh, Lorenzo and Isabella, the pair of young people in love, but she um, is her family is richer than his and she has jealous brothers who do not want her to marry beneath her station and um, if you know the poem you know that uh, the brothers will plot with the servant to kill Lorenzo but Isabella will find his body and being unable to bury him she will just take his head and hide it in a pot of basil. And all these things can be really deduced from this interesting painting. You can identify the brothers quite easily because they behave 
nastily and aggressively towards the young people. You can notice a malicious look on the servant and even, <coughs> excuse me, even uh, in the background, you can see a big fat pot of basil, which is there for a reason. Um, besides, it is a very realistic group of portraits of many friends and family members of, uh, of uh, John Everett Miller, including Dante Gabriel Rossetti, one of the guests at the table, the one raising a glass of wine uh, to his mouth, not looking through the glass, this is one of the brothers, but raising the glass to his mouth is actually uh, young Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Uh, another example is uh, Rossetti's painting The Blessed Damosel, illustrating one of his own poems. And this is the story about a young woman who died and went to heaven, but she's unhappy in heaven because she's separated from her lover who remained on earth. You may recall a very similar motive from Wuthering Heights. So we have the dream that Catherine has, that she dies and goes to heaven and she cries and sobs and uh, wails so much in heaven uh, that the angels get angry and throw her out and she says, now I'm happy, so I'm back to the Wuthering Heights and that's, that's what I really want. And this is the, the kind of image uh, that's quite popular in Victorian culture, the image of uh, passionate love uh, that does not end with death, that goes beyond death. So we have this uh, image of young women dying of love and dying of broken heart and uh, lovers um, despairing after uh, losing the object of their passion. So here we have one example and of course the next one is Ophelia, uh, one of the most um, widespread uh, subjects uh, in Victorian painting at all. If you Google Victorian Ophelia painting, you will find like 50 versions of Ophelia. This is perhaps the most famous one uh, by John Everett Miller uh, with uh, Lizzie, Lizzie Siddle um, posing as Ophelia, but uh, she was irresistible. Uh, once that she was a Shakespearean heroine and Shakespeare was like the second Bible for the Victorians. They believed there were two holy texts and these were the Bible and the works of William Shakespeare. So, um, of course, knowing the works of William Shakespeare was a mark of sophistication and education and high standards. So, of course, illustrating the works of Shakespeare was quite a popular thing in art. Uh, but Ophelia was especially fascinating because she combined some of the um, subjects that the Victorians found irresistible. She was young, but she died. She was in love, but she never married. Uh, she um, lost her mind. She became mad in the end. So the, the themes of uh, love and sexuality and madness and death mixed with the image of a <clears throat> pretty young woman, they were just irresistible. Another such example, a very similar example, also portrayed countless times, is the, um, the Lady of Shalott, one of the lesser Arthurian heroines also made very popular by the Victorian uh, poem, this time by Lord Tennyson. If you do not know it, Google it, The Lady of Shalott. Uh, so she was the enchanted noble woman living in the tower and she could not leave the tower. She couldn't even look straight out of the window because if she did that, she would die soon. Uh, she had a mirror on the wall and she spent her days um, weaving a tapestry. So she was again uh, some sort of artist. But once in the mirror, she saw a reflection of Sir Lancelot. And of course, she fell in love. She looked out of the window and uh, she knew that she was dying. So she found a boat 
Uh, she took her tapestry on which everything about her life was depicted and she floated downstream to the castle of Camelot where the Knights of the Round Table were gathering but before she reached this uh, castle she was dead in her boat already and in the, in the poem Lancelot finds her body and he says something oh uh, such a pity that she died she was so young and beautiful God save her soul so yes he never knew he never knew that she died for his love uh, and uh, if you look at Victorian paintings and pre Raphaelite paintings especially, uh, you have illustrations of different moments of this story. Either she's in the boat, like in the very <clears throat> famous painting by a slightly later artist, the next generation, so the artist who was inspired by the pre Raphaelites, John William Waterhouse. She is uh, very frail and dying in the boat or she releases the curse, like in the painting by uh, uh, William Holman Hunt. She is uh, in the middle of a tapestry. Uh, the loom is actually on the, on the floor and uh, she has just looked out of the window and her hair is flying around her head uh, as a kind of magic spell. So, um, again, uh, a combination of youth and death and passion and, uh, and love. So, yes, we do uh, have a lot of that in Victorian paintings. Uh, there are also other heroines and uh, perhaps the most uh, um, remarkable of these paintings are some portraits, so-called fancy portraits, so realistic portraits who show real sitters uh, posed as some characters from literature or mythology or um, other areas of culture. So the fancy portraits made by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. The first one I want to, uh, to show you is called Beata Beatrix. And this is the uh, portrait of Lizzie Siddle, Rossetti's wife. This is a very tragic story. They um, were partners for quite a long time. Uh, they had this, this kind of little thing between them that uh, Rossetti pretended he was the poet Dante and Lizzie was his Beatrice, his muse and, uh, and inspiration. But um, they finally married, but it didn't really help their relationship. Uh, he was uh, becoming a drug addict. He was notoriously unfaithful. Uh, she uh, got pregnant but miscarried the child, uh, so she was quite depressive. She always started uh, taking drugs herself. A very popular Victorian drug, uh, which was an opium solution called uh, uh, laudanum. And once when Rossetti returned from his round of uh, brothels and baths, he found Lizzie dead on the sofa. And it was never proven whether this was an accidental overdose or uh, a deliberate suicide, but he was grief stricken. He was very, he was feeling very guilty. So uh, he did two things. One was to start painting this uh, portrait of Lizzie as Beatrice, as kind of dying Beatrice, Beatrice being taken to heaven with a lot of symbols, some strange symbols like this red bird with a white poppy. Um, so, um, Laudanum was made from, from poppy seeds, so uh, perhaps this is, this is the illusion. And the other thing he did was to, <clears throat> to uh, take the only copy of his poems, the handwritten poems he was preparing for publication, and to put it uh, with Lizzie uh, into her, uh, her coffin and to bury it with Lizzie. Uh, unfortunately, a few years later, he regretted that and he um, paid some undertakers to dig up the coffin and to, to retrieve the, uh, the book uh, that was buried uh, with Lizzie. And there were all kinds of stories uh, like uh, that her beautiful red hair continued growing after she died. So the entire coffin was filled with this luxurious red hair that she had. And um, probably not really, but uh, but that's that's the story. In later life, Rossetti developed a very strong emotional attachment. You might even say a passion 
for um, Jane Morris, the wife of a close friend, the man that you are going to meet today as well, William Morris, the founder of the Art and Crafts Movement. Uh, and he painted uh, uh, Jane Morris repeatedly as all kinds of mythological characters and the, uh, <clears throat> the most uh, famous and perhaps the best is uh, painting her as Proserpine, which is the Roman name of the goddess Persephone, the goddess of the underworld, the daughter of the earth goddess, vegetation goddess Demeter, taken to the underworld by Hades, the god of, uh, of the underworld, uh, to be his queen. And here we have her. Um, if you look at Victorian paintings of women, very often it's interesting to look at their hands and their hair. They very often have beautiful uh, long hair, which they wear. Uh, in a very artistic fashion, so loose or uh, on only loosely um, coiffured, unlike the fashionable ladies of the time. And there is very often something interesting happening with the hair, like in Proserpine, we have one hand actually holding the other hand, which holds the pomegranate fruit, so the, the fruit that is associated with, uh, with Persephone. Uh, so um, again, we might think it's all symbolic that uh, Rossetti perhaps wanted to suggest that Jane was not happy in her marriage, that she felt trapped, that she longed for her freedom, like Persephone um, longed for the outdoors. So yes, perhaps. Uh, maybe. He continued um, painting all kinds of femme fatales and, and uh, other uh, very sensuous uh, images of women, very often showing, uh, showing Jane Morris um, towards uh, the end of his life. And uh, now we move on to another part. So now I would like to show you uh, the work of uh, two slightly later artists, but who were nevertheless very strongly influenced by the Frida Firelight. The first one is Edward Byrne Johns. Uh, he was the friend of the movement, uh, I would say half a generation younger than, uh, than the original brothers. He was uh, a close friend of William Morris as well. Uh, and if you look at his works, uh, they combine this kind of medievalizing uh, style of the pre Raphaelites with uh, neoclassicism. So uh, we have uh, kind of elongated uh, uh, female forms and generally human forms. Uh, we have uh, uh, draperies and uh, kind of uh, long flowing gowns which uh, might look ancient or medieval uh, depending on what he wanted to uh, to show uh, and just like uh, Rossetti had his private thing about the poet Dante um, Edward Byrne Jones had a similar fascination with the stories of King Arthur and uh, he even identified himself in some respects with the figure of the king himself. So many of, uh, of his uh, works uh, illustrate different aspects of, uh, of Arthurian legends and characters from Arthurian stories, like uh, here we have the beguiling of Merlin, Merlin the great magician from the Arthurian myths, uh, here being trapped in a tree, imprisoned in a tree by a young witch. So once again, we have uh, this is this is the um, later part of the nineteenth century, and we have a fascination with the figure of the femme fatale, the dangerous sexual woman. Uh, actually, if you know anything about the private life of uh, Edward Burne Jones, uh, he had a nice. Victorian, angelic, docile wife, but he also had a very passionate uh, Greek mistress whom he portrayed many times 
and I guess the 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 young witch Nimue from uh, uh, this painting is actually uh, based on uh, on this um, on this woman. Uh, also, we have the the image of a dangerous siren in the painting called "The Depths of the Sea." We have the mermaid drowning uh, um, a sailor, a naked man. And uh, if you look at this painting, you will notice that the mermaid, the femme fatale, the woman beast, she is looking straight at the viewer. She's looking out of the picture. She's not really coy or brooding or anything. She is uh, rather, I would say, offensive and, uh, and um, even aggressive and definitely not ashamed of, uh, uh, of um, uh, following her passion, being a predator. But sometimes they are, there are also um, good angelic women, um, holy women, like the, uh, the maidens who prepare uh, the arms and everything for the Knights of the Round Table. So uh, we have uh, the knights um, departing on the quest and uh, the maidens standing to them and their horses. Uh, this was actually the, um, the carton for the tapestry and uh, uh, we'll talk about it in a little moment when we talk about the arts and crafts movement. Uh, so Edward Van Jones not only produced paintings, he also designed uh, tapestries which would be later woven by the, uh, the craftspeople, mostly women, uh, working for the arts and crafts movement. Uh, another angelic woman is uh, Psyche, uh, the mythological heroine uh, known from the story of uh, Eros and Psyche. So she's the princess who was supposed to be, uh, to be sacrificed to a dragon, but the dragon, luckily for her, turned out to be god of love, Eros. And there is another image, uh, King Kopetua and the Beggar Maid. Uh, this is a legend, uh, a British legend about um, a king from some legendary past uh, who uh, went uh, incognito looking for a perfect woman to marry because he was quite tired with those fluttering um, courtiers and the noble ladies who were vain and uh, and um, untrue so he traveled uh, around his kingdom and uh, he finally chose this poor uh, young woman he met begging but even though she was very poor she was reduced to begging for bread uh, she had still uh, so much dignity and charm and majesty that he believed that if she could pull it off as a beggar, she would be even more majestic and noble as the queen. So here we have the king uh, and his, uh, his intended. Uh, the last picture of uh, uh, Edward Ben Jones is actually the last picture he ever painted. Uh, uh, the Last Sleep of King Arthur in Avalon and uh, he based the face of the king on his own features and it said that uh, very shortly after he finished this painting he died uh, actually quite suddenly um, in his home and he was found lying on the sofa dead just as King Arthur is lying here in Avalon on something that looks like a sofa as well. And uh, another artist uh, I would like to draw your attention to is uh, John William Waterhouse, so the author of um, The Lady of Shalot that we've seen already. And uh, he was also uh, later, he is turn of the century artist, but he is very strongly um, influenced uh, by the Pre-Raphaelite and especially this aspect of Pre-Raphaelite art that um, basically um, became most enduring. So beautiful uh, women, delicate young women 
uh, in flowing dresses with flowing hair, either as medieval characters uh, or um, classical mythological characters. And you have some uh, some examples here. So where here one of them is another Ophelia, but not. Uh, um, at the point of drowning but when she is mad in the meadow uh, collecting flowers and weaving the the rest of flowers another one is psyche opening the golden box of course the fateful golden box that would bring all the misfortunes and illnesses to the world because of her curiosity and the last one here is Narcissus which has been identified by many critics as another take on, um, on um, uh, Persephone, Persephone gathering the plant just before she is kidnapped by Hades and we, we will continue. So the last part uh, will be um, divided between two subjects. One is uh, um, a new kind of artist that starts to emerge in the 19th century, namely the photographer. The art of photography, the skill, the, the craft of photography started developing um, ever since the 1840s really. Uh, but uh, towards the end of the 19th century, uh, the technology was greatly simplified, uh, so um, non-professionals could uh, take pictures uh, and uh, artists could start experimenting with the medium of photography for artistic reasons. And, uh, there is an artist I would like you to uh, to know and perhaps to Google to see more of her works. Her name was Julia Margaret Cameron and she was a very unique photographer in which she also was greatly inspired by the Pre-Raphaelites. If you look at, uh, at her um, art, it's uh, full of Arthurian uh, themes and uh, beautiful women and angelic children. So. Uh, the images that were all rather close to um, to the hearts of the of the Pre-Raphaelites, uh, she treated her uh, photography as a canvas. So basically, these are like um, posed pictures and costumed pictures. She would. Uh, uh, gather her models and dress them and position them in a way she uh, she found um, appropriate and then she would take the uh, the shots and develop them um, herself uh, she uh, was quite popular she was quite respected by the um, intellectuals although he she had quite a lot of problems uh, with um, her attempts of becoming the member of the Royal Photographic Society, the professional uh, group, the professional guild of photographers and uh, all men, of course, uh, who were in this, uh, in this uh, club believed that uh, she uh, could not be admitted because it's not a ladylike thing to deal with chemicals and of course to develop uh, photographs you needed to be quite prolific with chemistry and to deal uh, to uh, to actually get your hands dirty with chemicals of different kinds too. Um, I don't really remember whether at last they, uh, they accepted her. I think they did but it really took a long time. And the last thing, the last uh, few images I would like you to, uh, to see uh, feature the work of William Morris, so another close friend of the Pre-Raphaelites and Edward Burne Jones and the husband, unfortunate husband of Jane Morris, the muse of, um, of uh, Rossetti, but he's mostly uh, remembered as uh, the founder of the so-called Arts and Crafts movement, which was um, another artistic movement but not so much focused on the painting. 
he uh, tried to become a painting. He, I think he completed only one uh, work in his life uh, as a painter, which showed uh, a medieval-styled woman, of course, based on his then fiance uh, Jane. Uh, some say this is Queen Guinevere, some say uh, this is Isolde, um, it's hard to say really, uh, so we have this medieval lady, very Arthurian looking, uh, so she's one of those Arthurian heroines. Uh, but he was not happy with the result, uh, well the only good thing for him uh, was that uh, Jane uh, agreed to marry him. Um, although later on, as you as you know now, they were not very happy together. So he uh, started to experiment with other aspects of art uh, and mostly uh, interior design and, um, and uh, fabric design. So uh, he was, like the Pre-Raphaelite, very strongly influenced by the Arthurian legends and uh, by the, uh, the medieval subjects. Uh, he uh, very strongly believed that uh, a good thing about the Middle Ages was that uh, the craftsmen were responsible for the entirety of their work. I'll give you the, uh, the link to a very interesting uh, documentary called This is Civilization. Uh, there will be a, um, an episode on <clears throat> Victorian medievalism and, uh, and the idea how <clears throat> return to the Middle Ages was supposed to save the souls of the Victorians. But this is basically what they believe, that uh, modern work was dehumanizing because the person who produced goods was not responsible for the entirety of the project. So somebody designed it, then another person uh, produced it and another person sold it. Sometimes some people collaborated in the production of uh, an object and this was really alienating and dehumanizing and uh, William Morris believed that uh, what should be done as a remedy was to return to the traditional arts and crafts um, as they were in the pre-industrial period. So he designed um, furniture, he even dabbled in architecture, but rather, let's say, architectural decorations than uh, designing entire houses. <clears throat> but um, he, uh, he designed interiors, but his specialty was the wallpapers. And uh, the William Morris wallpapers are really a, um, a fascinating subject. We have a few um, images um, in, the, uh, in the presentation. You may want to Google, just Google William Morris wallpaper and you'll see um, what kind of projects he did. Uh, very often they were very uh, elaborate and intricate and they would very often combine elements of uh, nature, like the very, very famous willow branches um, and um, birds and some medieval um, geometric designs. Uh, so uh, they would basically furnish the room almost. And the Victorians, they didn't really like minimalism. So everything in those interiors was decorated. The wallpaper was decorative, the, uh, the um, objects, the trinkets, the furniture, the fabrics, everything could be quite heavy and quite decorative. And actually, uh, the attempts of the artists um, grouped in uh, Morris's Arts and Crafts movement uh, were simple, simpler than your standard Victorian interior designs. Uh, especially uh, the kind of furniture uh, he designed uh, that was inspired by um, traditional folk furniture, folk designs. Uh, so um, here we have uh, one of the chairs that he designed, a very famous object called the Sussex chair. So uh, the design that was based on the traditional country design 
uh, without upholstery, without uh, springs that were very fashionable in uh, um, mainstream uh, chairs and sofas. Um, so definitely simpler than um, the kind of um, furniture that dominated, uh, dominated in the Victorian period. And uh, this is something that we are going to discuss next week, namely what was the mainstream uh, that those uh, young rebellious artists um, objected to? What were they rebelling against? So um, see you next week.